Hello everyone. Today we'll be talking about hypercapnia again. So let's get started. We understood that carbon dioxide is transported in three forms: bicarb, carbaminohemoglobin, and dissolved forms. And we understood that carbon dioxide rises when you give oxygen to these patients, mostly because of worsening VQ mismatch and Bohr's Harlan effect. There's also some reduction in hypoxia drive. We also understood that the rate of transfer of CO2 from pulmonary capillaries to alveoli is very rapid. Let's talk about pros and cons of hypercapnia and try to understand how carbon dioxide can help you or harm you. Everybody knows about the depressed level of consciousness that comes with hypercapnia. Etiology of this is unclear at this time, but Scientists believe that it might be related to some alteration in intracellular pH and increased activity in brain glutamate and GABA receptors. Scientists have also noted decreased level in glutamate and aspartate as well. More important effect of hypercapnia is that it increases the cerebral blood flow and therefore increases the intracranial pressure. The cerebral blood flow increases by 1 to 2 ml per 100 grams per minute per millimeter rise of PaCO2. To decrease the ICP, you can hyperventilate these patients, which causes hypocapnia. And if you reduce the PaCO2 to 20 to 25 millimeters of mercury, you can decrease the cerebral blood flow by 40 to 50 percent. And this should decrease your ICP. However, during the sustained hypocapnia, the cerebral blood flow will recover to about 10 percent of its baseline by four hours. Therefore, we use the hyperventilation only for acute short-term drop in ICP. In patients with elevated ICP, try to maintain their PCO2 around 40. If you are worried about impending herniation, you can use hyperventilation to your advantage, which will cause a rapid drop in cerebral blood flow and therefore reduces the ICP. Meanwhile, you can constitute more definitive treatments like mannitol or hypertonic saline to treat these patients. Hypercapnia has been shown to depress the myocardial contractility. However, at the level of pH at which this happens has been debated. Hypercapnia also causes vasodilation and reflex sympathoadrenal activation. And a combination of these two effects is that the net cardiac output is mostly maintained or maybe increased. In one study, they found that hypercapnia reduces pulmonary edema better than dobutamine. Hypercapnia similarly depresses diaphragmatic function. It also increases the pulmonary vascular resistance and the effect is mostly from the pH. Therefore, it can worsen the pulmonary hypertension. However, hypercapnia potentiates the hypoxemic vasoconstriction, therefore improves the VQ matching and therefore reduces shunt. Hypocapnia, on the other hand, worsens shunts. Hypercapnia causes acidosis, which results in leakage of potassium from cells to plasma, and it can also increase the ionized calcium. Increase in PaCO2 by 12 millimeters mercury drops the pH by 0.1. Lower pHs, less than 7.1, may cause hemodynamic instability. Consensus is that pH of more than 7.15 is well tolerated. Elevated CO2 also acts as a mild immunosuppression. It inhibits neutrophils and phagocytosis. It also reduces cytokine levels. One of the important effects of hypercapnia is its positive effect on oxygenation. CO2 shifts the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve to the right and therefore increases the oxygen delivery to the tissues. It also increases the cardiac output and reduces shunt as we have seen previously. It also has been shown to improve the peripheral tissue oxygenation and reduces cellular oxygen consumption. In experimental animals, hypercapnic acidosis has shown to protect heart following ischemia reperfusion injury and similar observation has been seen in brain as well. So after all this, hypercapnia may not be that bad. We know that its effects are mostly from lowering the pH and we know that its hemodynamic effects are not significant till pH drops to less than 7.15. However, at this time we are not sure 
how much lower pH we can tolerate with hypercapnia at this point. So my suggestion would be to individualize risk and benefit of hypercapnia in your patients. The risk of hypercapnia would include your elevated ICP. So keep your patient normocapnic if you suspect elevated ICP. It can lead to hemodynamic compromise, especially when the pH is lower than 7.15. You can also increase the RV afterload and can worsen RV failure. The benefits of hypercapnia are increased VQ matching and increased oxygen delivery. And the benefit of the hypercapnia that we talked about are most visible at pH of 7.2 or higher. So low levels of pH for example, if your pH is 7.25, is very well tolerated and possibly slightly beneficial for your patient. In ARDS, protective lung ventilation with low tidal volumes will often result in hypercapnia. However, in ARDS, lung protective ventilation has been the only modality that has shown to improve mortality and also shown to decrease ventilator-induced lung injury. In comparison, though hypercapnia can result in the complications as we discussed before, advantages of lung protective ventilation with low tidal volume ventilation trumps hypercapnia. It's absolutely okay to tolerate high pacu 2 even if pH drops as low as 7.15. Below 7.15, evaluate the risk and benefits of tolerating lower pH. The protective effect in lung protective ventilation is from low tidal volumes and not from hypercapnia. Clinical signs of hypercapnia include headaches and hypersomnolence. As your hypercapnia worsens, you can have altered mental status, asterixis, myoclonus, and even seizures. Normal patient may not have symptoms till the PSU2 rises up to 60 to 70 millimeters of mercury, while the chronic hypercapnic patient can tolerate even higher rise up to 80 to 90 millimeters of mercury. So let's understand what are the various reasons for hypercapnia. CO2 can rise if you are making more CO2. That means there is increased production of CO2. And this can happen with increase in muscular activity as seen in increased work of breathing, seizures, agitation, serotonin syndrome and malignant hyperthermia. And it can also be seen in hypermetabolic states such as fevers, sepsis, and hyperthyroidism. There can be problem with the transporting of CO2, and we have already seen that if you give these guys oxygen, you can displace the CO2 from the hemoglobin molecule into the solution, therefore rising the PaCO2. Shunts and VQ mismatch can also result in hypercapnia. However, their contribution is pretty small, or the degree of VQ mismatch has to be large and more towards the shunt physiology. Diffusion across alveolo-capillary membrane is almost never a problem as CO2 diffuses many times faster than oxygen and you will deal with hypoxia much more before hypercapnia in these situations. In all these four conditions, a higher amount of CO2 in the blood is going to stimulate your respiratory center and therefore it will be counteracted by increase in minute ventilation so the most important cause for hypercapnia is decreased alveolar ventilation. And decreased alveolar ventilation comes in two parts. First is when your minute ventilation is decreased. That means your either your respiratory rate and your tidal volume going down. In cases with decreased minute ventilation, the cause for this is depression in your respiratory center or its pathways. The second reason for decreased alveolar ventilation is increase in dead space ventilation. So your minute ventilation can remain the same. However, if your ventilation is going more into the areas of dead space where there is no CO2 exchange, overall the alveolar ventilation where the CO2 can really get exchanged can drop down. So that can result in hypercapnia. Hypercapnia from dead space ventilation is also counteracted by increase in minute ventilation. Now we understand that what are the different reasons why you can develop hypercapnia. Let's try to develop a mathematical model intuitively. So the PaCO2 would depend upon how much CO2 is produced by the cells 
and how much the CO2 is removed by your lungs. As your PaCO2 production increases, the PaCO2 will rise if your minute ventilation does not increase. However, any rise in PaCO2 will stimulate your respiratory center to increase your minute ventilation and that will drop your PaCO2 back to normal. However, under certain circumstances, like when a patient is sedated on the ventilator, the respiratory center is not that active and your PSU2 can rise with increased production. The second process, which is the removal of CO2, is the more important one, which controls the PSU2. So PSU2 will be lower if your removal of carbon dioxide increases. And this increase happens because of increase in alveolar ventilation. You know the alveolar ventilation is nothing but minute ventilation minus anatomical dead space. One of the things you have to understand that anatomical dead space is constant. So if you increase the minute ventilation, all the increase in volumes will go towards increasing the alveolar ventilation. So in this case, the tidal volume in has increased in this difference between gray circle and a black circle while you can see that the anatomical space has not changed. As your minute ventilation increases, so does your alveolar ventilation and your PaCO2 drops. The things become a little bit more complicated when you have alveolar dead space alongside. In this case, when you increase the minute ventilation, some of the volume will go towards increasing the alveolar dead space as well. So the difference between the black circle and the gray circle in the alveolar region and dead space region, that's where your tidal volumes will go. So in effect, even if you have increased the minute ventilation, your alveolar ventilation doesn't increase at the same rate. So your PSU2 will fall to a lower degree. The way we figure it out is we subtract the dead space ventilation from the minute ventilation. Now we know that alveolar ventilation is nothing but minute ventilation minus dead space ventilation. If you divide this equation by minute ventilation, you can simplify it further to show that alveolar ventilation is nothing but minute ventilation multiplied by one minus dead space fraction. The VD by VE is a dead space fraction. It constitutes both of anatomical and alveolar dead spaces. So here we come to the formula that you would have read in the books. The PSU2 depends upon production and removal. So increase in PSU2 will occur if your production of CO2 has increased or your alveolar ventilation has decreased. Alveolar ventilation has got two component, the minute ventilation and the dead space fraction. So decrease in minute ventilation will decrease the alveolar ventilation and increase in dead space fraction will also decrease the alveolar ventilation. PSU2 is constant multiplied by VCO2 divided by minute ventilation into one minus dead space fraction. So in short, PSU2 can increase only due to three factors, increased production, decreased minute ventilation, or increased dead space ventilation. When you make changes in the ventilator settings or anything to change minute ventilation, wait 30 to 60 minutes before repeating the ABG if you want to look at the PSU2. And this happens because there is a large bicarb buffer stores in your body of the order of 120 liters and it takes about 20 to 30 minutes before the equilibration of CO2 occurs. Oxygen on the other hand equilibrates much faster. So if you increased somebody's minute ventilation, you can see that the, the CO2 equilibrates in around 30 minutes and if you have decreased somebody's minute ventilation, it can take up to an hour. Try to test your ABG as soon as possible because PaCO2 rises by 0.1 millimeters mercury per minute at 37 degrees and PO2 drops by 1 to 2 millimeters mercury per minute at 37 degrees. If possible, avoid getting peripheral venous blood gas to evaluate your PaCO2. Usually the PaCO2 is four to five millimeters mercury lower than PVCO2, so some extrapolation can be made. However, remember that VBG is from a peripheral vein, so you are looking at the CO2 produced by the cells from the hand. 
and if your patient has decreased peripheral circulation or is in a state of shock, your PCO2 will be much less accurate and the difference of 4 to 5 may not stand. If you really cannot get an ABG and want a VBG to check the PCO2, try to see if you can get it from a center line. Those would be possibly more accurate. However, still in shock, the PCO2 between the arterial and venous can differ by a lot. Another cool fact to remember is that if your patient is not breathing, your PSU2 will rise about 3 to 4 millimeters of mercury every minute. In summary, hypercapnia results in altered sensorium, elevated ICP, respiratory acidosis, and depression of cardiac and diaphragmatic muscles. Hypercapnia also results in better VQ matching and improve oxygen delivery. Altered mental status from hypercapnia is typically observed with elevation of PACO2 up to 60 to 70 million plus of mercury. However, hypercapnic patient can tolerate much higher PACO2. Decrease in alveolar ventilation is the main reason for hypercapnia and this happens because of two reasons. Either there is a decrease in minute ventilation or there is an increase in dead space ventilation. Always wait 30 to 60 minutes before repeating an ABG after ventilator changes if you want to evaluate PACO2. While for PO2, you can get ABG earlier in 5 to 10 minutes. Thank you. In next lecture, we'll talk about hypercapnia from increased production.